Welcome to Folds and Curves. I'm your host, Mo Cash Kush. Today's guest is Stefanos Kutsukos. Stefanos understands the rare genetic disease landscape extremely well, as he's had experience navigating this space as a patient with his and his family's rare inherited skin condition called ASPRV1 mediated ichthyosis. But he also brings another cool perspective to the table because he's a fellow at the National Human Genome Research Institute studying biochemical disorders and AAV gene therapies to treat rare diseases. He's also a consultant at Rarebase, so I definitely consider him somebody with deep insight into rare disease from multiple different perspectives. Interestingly enough, I met Stefanos through his presence on the Clubhouse app where he's consistently and regularly educating the biotech community and the broader public on the ins and outs of genetics and rare disease. I hope you all enjoy this episode and please remember to check out the show notes to read more about Stefanos and find him online. I found his Medium blog post to be particularly worth reading. Let's get started. <laughs> uh, hey Stefanos, thanks for joining us. You said, thanks, Mo. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks for bringing me on. Yeah, no problem. It's, a, it's definitely an honor. Um, I think you have a, a really interesting story I wanted to talk about. You wrote a, a really, really uh, insightful, uh, easy to follow, and um, I think important medium uh, blog post or article um, about something called a, a diagnostic odyssey. Um, and I was hoping you could explain to me what a diagnostic odyssey is and, and how it affected you and, and uh, if you could tell us your story. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, the word diagnostic odyssey has become kind of very prevalent in the rare disease world, really meaning the, the way by which a patient usually with an undiagnosed condition uh, goes through their journey to figure out their ultimate diagnosis. And for, for many different diseases, it's, it, it can be for different, but for mine specifically, I was hoping and wanting to get a genetic diagnosis. Um, but my diagnostic odyssey really starts, I guess, long before me um, with with my mother, and um, and her uh, being noticed by my great uncle when he was coming to visit one day um, when she was in her uh, when she was just a kid, I think around five years old, maybe even before then, and him noticing. Um, abnormal skin, like really dry and scaly skin that, that caused uh, some alarm, I guess, with my grandparents and, and, and of which they thought would, they would need a dermatologist opinion. Um, so sure enough, they did uh, take her to a dermatologist. And that was when she was diagnosed with the rare disease called ichthyosis, uh, which is a disease characterized, in fact, by dry and scaly skin. Um, we, I guess we can fast forward all the way until today and say that there are many different types of ichthyosis. Um, in fact, I think almost 20, between 20 and 30 subtypes. Um, but back then it wasn't exactly known. There were some ideas of, of what type she had, um, but uh, it, it, was, it was not for sure. Um, and so the dermatologist that my grandparents saw originally actually referred my mother and grandparents to a study that was ongoing at the NIH, which kind of serendipitously and coincidentally started just recently that was for the study of ichthyosis specifically, mm -hmm. uh, which is really, which was, you know, I guess you could say probably the perfect timing. Yeah. Um, so that once she enrolled in that study, she became, uh, she of course became like a research participant and a research subject, um, which we can definitely talk more about later. Um, but she would bring bags of cream home uh, from her physicians that she would see at the NIH and, and they worked to, to help maintain the disease of which she, uh, uh, of which it did help quite a bit, uh, mm -hmm. but she would see those physicians for the next uh, decades to come. Yeah. Um, and then, so how did that translate to, to you getting, because I know you were talking about uh, research participants and I know um, this sort of journey or odyssey um, in many ways, kind of culminated with you participating in a genetic study. Um, could you could you talk about that study a little bit? Yeah, sure. So I will say, the, I guess there is a, there is a, a key uh, event or in which my parents 
were actually still seeing physicians and genetic counselors at the NIH mm -hmm. when they decided to have a baby, uh, me. And it was uh, interesting that back then, it, the, I guess, consensus was that their children, my parents' children, me, would not have this hereditary disorder, that it would not be passed down. Mm -hmm. So that hypothesis was, of course, quickly rejected when, when I came along. And within, I think, the first six months, which is usually when this disease presents, um, I, in fact, started having dry and scaly skin. So, of course, from the learnings that my mom was able to gather from the NIH, the maintenance of the disease was the same for when, from when she was a child to, to, to mine, to my maintenance. Um, so I guess, you know, I, I, we can fast forward all the way to when I went to college of which, you know, for being a rare disease or for having a rare disease, I, I always like to say I'm the a lucky rare disease patient, considering the fact that I can manage my condition relatively well mm -hmm. um, and that it's not progressive. So that allowed me to go to college and, um, and study biochemistry. And so my, my taking of especially genetics classes really started uh, having me question the genetic causality of my own condition. And I started asking, you know, what, what does cause our ichthyosis? Because if you remember back to even all, all the way uh, to when my mom was being seen by physicians at the NIH, there were some ideas, but there were no, there was not a definitive uh, type, let alone genetic cause. Yeah. So I uh, looked at, or there's a, of course, a patient advocacy organization for this umbrella of conditions called FIRST, the Foundation for Ichthyosis and Related Skin Types. Okay. And on their website, they had a, uh, they had a posting of which was called, I think, um, like a gene discovery project, which is sponsored by um, the Yale School of Medicine. And so I, I got in contact with that group and said, hey, I have an undiagnosed type of ichthyosis. I'd love to enroll in your study. And so sure enough, I, he sent the kit, their team sent me a, a saliva kit, and of which I, of course, spit into and sent back. And, uh, and, and then the waiting began for, for a publication of, of our genetic diagnosis. Um, so what did they do with your spit? They, I understand they, they sequenced it. I'm, so um, we'll get into what you're doing now because it's obviously mm -hmm. very relevant. But um, for now, I'm, I am curious, uh, how did they sequence your spit? What did they do with it? Sure. So they, I was the first sample of, of what ended up being, I think, five or six from my family. And they did what's called whole exome sequencing. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know all the details besides that, um, but basically it's a way to, to um, genetically sequence all the coding regions of your genome, which encodes about, which is about 2%, one to 2% of your, of the entirety of your genome that are mm -hmm. protein encoding, of course. Yeah. Um, so they were able to find what they thought they found was interesting. So I got a call and uh, this call was from a medical student um, from this group at the time. And uh, he said, we found something interesting. We'd like to enroll your, your mother, your brother, your maternal grandparents, as well as an unaffected, um, in my case, uh, aunt or uncle, but for my mom, of course, her brother. Uh, and so then the journey kind of continued onward with, with more genetic sequencing and, and then toward, uh, toward what became a new genetic cause of ichthyosis. Yeah, so what did they find um, as being the genetic cause? Um, I, I, if you want to describe the, the gene uh, mutation that they found. Yeah, sure. So this paper, so the, of course, I sent my saliva back in February of 2016, and uh, the remainder of my family sent in theirs, I believe, later that year in, in December, late December, early January of 2017. And so back in just last year, 2020, June, I believe, 10th is when I got an email from a pub crawler, which basically will scan new papers coming out on PubMed. Uh, oh, that's for cool. <laughs> particular, all, it is neat. Yeah. Especially if you're really particularly interested in something. So of course me being super interested in this uh, physician's work, uh, I had a, a crawler sent out and I got an email that said uh, mutations in ASPRV1, that's the gene, uh, cause dominantly inherited ichthyosis. And, you know, by the title, I didn't immediately think that that was ours, but what I, uh, what I did when his papers came out, I'd read the abstract, of course, to kind of get an idea for exactly what was being studied. And so sure enough, I, I immediately knew this was ours after having read the abstract and then seeing one of the pedigrees, which was our exact family. Um, 
and also this physician scientist was nice enough to acknowledge me. And so then I, that was kind of confirm, you know, the, I guess, greatest of confirmations that uh, we, that this was our paper. Um, but yeah, this little gene, it's, it's a one exon gene. It's called ASPRV1, uh, aspartic retroviral like one protein. Um, and uh, it's, it, it basically, at least as it's defined in the paper, it's a little protease that cuts up a much larger skin protein called filaggrin into its many different monomers. Um, so we, we can get maybe into more of like the biochem and some of the molecular genetics in a little bit, but it's, um, it, it's kind of, it is interesting that there are other types of ichthyosis that are very much related to this specific bigger protein filaggrin. Um, but ours was one of the first that, uh, was, that was found to be caused by this ASPRV1. Yeah, it's, um, it's definitely fascinating. Um, so like, I obviously looked at this paper to prepare for talking to you about it. And it just really struck me as something that's astounding. When you look at these, these, uh, I guess, familiar trees, I don't know exactly what the scientific term is, but these genetic trees, basically, and I'm looking at one and I'm like, that dot is uh, Stefanos. And that's like his mother <laughs> and his grandfather. And there's real people behind these, but it's such a small study where they're literally showing uh, i think you were three or four families out of a couple of thousands that they they looked at um uh, yeah, that's right and like it's literally just a study describing like three or four families and it's it's just really uh, amazing so that's um it's a great story behind uh, a fascinating paper um so so you you know you have um asprv1 mediated uh ichthyosis um, and you are well versed in biochemistry, and you know you're so good at it that you get this fellowship at the NIH, um, at the National Human Human Genome Research Institute. Um, so, like, what what drew you to the uh, Human Genome Research Institute? Sure. So, my you know my of course early study and and um, of biochemistry and genetics, and and then me also becoming fascinated by my own rare disease caused me to become interested in, in many other types of rare diseases. Mm -hmm. And so I was lucky enough to be introduced by um, a physician at the NHGRI who sure enough works on uh, rare diseases and then also next generation um, or, or uh, yeah, next generation genetic technologies for their treatment. Um, so we study biochemical disorders, which are um, not necessarily inherited skin disorders, but nonetheless still very rare and and the principles of which drug development is, is founded on for these conditions could be applied elsewhere to inherited skin conditions. So that mm -hmm. I'd wanted to, so knowing that I, I took the opportunity to join the group um, where I've been ever since. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Um, so can you uh, expand a little bit on like this biochemical basis? Um, like how does that relate to genetics? I mean, obviously the gene is a chemical entity in biology. Is that the extent of it? Or did you mean something more by that? Sure. So yeah, I can even use, of course, ASPRV1 and myectheosis as a framework. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess in the context of what's exactly going on here, like you do have, of course, your, your whole entire genome, every single set of, of all your 23 chromosomes that encode for all the proteins and, and other things that we maybe don't even know about at this point. Um, uh, but, but of those 20,000 genes, they kind of all have to like work in, in harmony to be, to create you, right? Mm -hmm. And so it could be as simple or as little as a one nucleotide substitution, like it is in our case, that one of those genes ends up uh, encoding for a protein that doesn't work. So sure enough, in ASPRV1, it, as I mentioned before, it's a one exon gene that basically just means it's a tiny gene. But we have a substitution on, uh, on the nine or the 595th nucleotide of the sequence that is a, that's supposed to be a, ooh, I think it's, it's supposed to be an A, but ours is a G. And so that uh, codon is then substituted from a uh, K, a lysine, to a glutamic acid. That's, it's tough to remember, <laughs> but yeah. that's a position um, 199 of the protein. So that one little change, of course, causes the entirety of the disease. So that's kind of where, of course, you know, the genetics uh, translate into or cause the biochemical uh, mm -hmm. phenotype in our case. So maybe we can expand a little bit on what we were discussing earlier, which is what does ASPRV1 do? 
-hmm. And it, again, it's a little tiny gene that encodes for about a three, 200 something, 300 amino acid protein that okay. cuts up this much larger protein called phylagrin or filament aggregating protein um, into a bunch of it's like little, uh, into a bunch of monomers uh, of which those monomers then go to be, uh, be catalyzed. Is that like a structural protein of the skin? Structural? It is. Okay. It is. It's a major structural protein. Exactly. Okay. Uh, at least in its, in its pro form and then its, uh, its uh, downstream form. Um, but it's broken up into what become natural moisturizing factors for the skin. So uh, okay. that kind of makes sense that, of course, you know, when you're missing that, uh, that transition from the, the full phylagrin, the pro phylagrin into its small little monomers, you do lose all that hydration ability of the skin. So right. that's where, of course, the dry skin comes from, uh, let alone the fact that the skin isn't able to come from the, uh, from the bottom or the basal layer up to the epidermis correctly. And then that's where you get the scaling. Okay. So, um, so you mentioned uh, that you feel like extremely lucky that um, in your case, it's something that you can manage um, and something where your, your quality of life is, is not impacted to the same degree as other people who might not get the opportunity to uh, go to college. Um, just as some quick like disease state awareness, I always like to kind of think about the patients. Um, like, could you describe some of the more severe forms of ichthyosis to whatever degree you're aware of? Uh, you know, not the one necessarily that you have, but sure. um, I understand that there's some that are much more severe and debilitating. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So um, yeah, I, you know, it's, as I said, there are many more subtypes and, and more are being added every day by the study, mm -hmm. well, not every day, but more frequent than, uh, than you probably could imagine. You know, there are some more severe types and I can maybe think of one, Netherton syndrome, which actually is not only ichthyosis, but in fact, it's, it is an inborn error of metabolism. And so not only do the manifestations, I guess, present on the skin, but you'll also have um, biochemical uh, phenotype, a biochemical phenotype internally. So I, I'm not well versed in the exact pathology, but I believe there is some level of having to manage what you eat and what you're able to eat. Um, yeah. that, and, you know, there are of course a bunch of other, uh, more severe types first is a great resource to go see what some of them are. And of course, look at the types of research that's being done into their, um, genetics, but also their potential treatment. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so I think this is kind of a good segue into, you know, the genetics of the disease, um, and you know, how that may or may not translate into, um, therapy. Um, so your, your sort of therapy, um, is very supportive, right? It's, uh, it's like emollients and, and lotions and moisturizers. You're not typically treating your form of ichthyosis with a, um, sort of genetic treatment. Is, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Hope, and hopefully though, that's not right for long because that absolutely okay. could be an option. Right. So what makes, um, like are all, well, so this is a single point mutation, I believe you mentioned. Um, are those type of point mutations, um, in theory at least, um, candidates for gene therapy type of solutions? Yeah, yeah. I, I, would, say, I would say it depends. And mm -hmm. it could depend on really the nature of the disease. So one thing that I, we haven't discussed yet is the fact that um, just by the nature of the genetics, and if you think that my, it was a de novo mutation in my mom, so my grandparents didn't have any um, this, they did not have this point mutation neither. Oh, okay. So, but, and neither does my dad. So it is, it is uh, inherited dominantly. And in, and in this case, it's, it was hypothesized by the paper, not exactly proven that it's a dominant negative condition. So really that, that meaning that you have one good allele and one bad allele, but unfortunately the bad allele, um, does enough harm to where the, of course you get the phenotype that we do. Mm -hmm. So, so when it comes to therapeutics and when it, when it comes to like how I want to think about how to um, ameliorate this disease, let alone other autosomal dominant negative skin conditions, inherited skin conditions, I want to think about ways that we can knock down this, this bad allele, which is kind of contrary to most of the gene therapy approaches to use today in, in many diseases, because they're usually recessive in nature. So okay ultimately you would like to replace two, you would like to replace two bad alleles in those conditions with at least one good one. 
And you usually have enough of a therapeutic effect in that case to where you'll see an improvement in phenotype. And it's been proven, we've seen that clinically. In skin diseases, we've seen, we've seen some, I think, preliminary evidence preclinically as well as clinically to some degree. Uh, we need much more that, uh, that, that you can use genetic therapies to ameliorate conditions and, uh, um, and ultimately correct their deficiencies or their genetic causalities. Uh, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, there's a lot of work to do. And I, it's, uh, it's an interesting space because when you talk about how like rare these conditions are, you have to remember back, which I don't know if we've gone over yet, but our condition has only, I think 10 or 13. I mean, you, you probably know better since you just looked over it, but nonetheless, like less than 15 total patients total. Mm -hmm. Is that all of them? We don't know, but you could probably imagine that's a good amount of us, I should say. Yeah, yeah, like maybe the right order of magnitude or something like that. Exactly. So how do you come up with a condition, especially, I'm sorry, a treatment, especially mm -hmm. a genetic treatment, which can be expensive uh, for such a small population? Um, and then let alone you have to th the fact that you have to think about how do you get this to a potential technology across the entirety of the largest organ in the body, the skin? Yeah, yeah, right. That, that's um, definitely a, a major uh, uh, consideration. So um, I guess how, how do, so that you said that there's 15 to 20 people who are known and potentially more. Um, how are these people actually uh, finding out that they have this condition? I mean, you said that you found it out through the study that you participated in. You knew that you had ichthyosis, but not necessarily what caused the ichthyosis. Um, do people basically are only being diagnosed through studies or almost like a chance like scenario, or is there some sort of system in place to help people get diagnosed? Sure. So yeah, I, you know, it is, I, I think luckily it's a little bit better than by chance, but maybe not too far. We have a lot of work to do. And this is where a lot of patient advocacy organizations will come in. Of okay. course, knowing we have ichthyosis, we go to uh, the foundation for ichthyosis and are able to be connected with centers of excellence, such as the one that was able to diagnose us. But you're right, if you are, if you are not in the US or if you are unaware even in the US of, of FIRST, you might not necessarily have the best, um, the best or the easiest, I should say, uh, uh, of finding your actual genetic diagnosis. And for a condition like ichthyosis, I, I really, I always will say it matters immensely, but for the current management, because it's so, similar across different subtypes, mm -hmm. you would probably imagine that uh, it, it's not like you're not going to, your management is not going to change drastically uh, by knowing a genetic causality, but that's not to say, I, I mean, I still think it's of absolute importance because this is what will allow patients to drive change and, and drive new therapeutic developments, which of course are much better, I can tell you, or hopefully will be than the current standard. Yeah. Um, no, that makes, that makes complete sense. Um, I think patient advocacy groups are, um, it's like one of those things you don't realize how important they are until they don't exist because there's like very, very, very little information that you can find on certain conditions that doesn't come from patient advocacy groups, uh, unless you are like, you know, very, uh, well-versed in looking through the medical literature, which, you know, most random people in the United States are not good at that or, or not, have not been trained to, be, to do that. Um, right. Yeah. So, I mean, patient advocacy, uh, all the way, I, I almost, um, I've always been aware of them, but, uh, only in the last like couple months have I really sort of seen just how important they are, especially in, in the, uh, rare disease space. Um, so, I guess my uh, question is, my next question is, um, unless, is there anything more you wanted to talk about um, related to your, you know, ASPRV1 related ichthyosis or, you know, your experience um, before sort of moving on to some of, um, some of your work at the uh, NHGRI? Yeah, sure. You know, something that would be interesting to talk about, which could be, you know, a whole other discussion in and of itself is, is the is how do we drive diagnoses faster? Mm -hmm. Because ultimately, again, like back to what I, I think we were just talking about, you ultimately you need a genetic diagnosis if you ever want to think of, of driving new therapeutic new therapeutics forward. Mm -hmm. And I will say for me and our condition in my family, 
we waited um, almost five years, more mm-hmm. than five years to be able to actually get our diagnosis. And, and that is five um, years from the time you enrolled in the study. Yes, exactly. Okay, Gotcha. And yeah. And, you know, I'll, you know, to some degree, I would say that's probably like on average, I think there are statistics out there that describe how long diagnostic odysseys will take for patients. But what I see being in the space of, of, of academic medicine to, to whatever degree I am so far, um, and what I've seen in, in my own journey in Odyssey is that there are so many ways or in areas that can be improved to actually get that genetic diagnosis much faster. Mm-hmm. Because a faster genetic diagnosis means a faster uh, or a faster start to translational uh, science and translational pursuits. Mm-hmm. So this really revolves to me around the problem of data sharing, which in mm-hmm. academia does not exist. Uh-huh. And, uh, and the fact that I personally believe, and I'll, I'll, this might be an extremist view, but I will always say that if a patient re- requests their data, even in the research setting, no matter where along the timeline that they request that data, they should be given access, no question. A lot of people, you know, people will push back and uh, I'm, I'm like, let's go, let's, let's debate because uh, there's, regardless of, of your fears and regardless of, and not you personally, Mo, but <laughs> the fears <laughs> of, of other people in the, in the field, all I, all I was, all I, I guess, uh, was, was faced, all I faced in, in not getting my own data back, which I did request, was a slow to timeline. And, mm-hmm. and, and having to wait many more years than I probably would have wanted to uh, mm-hmm. in order to get a diagnosis. Um, and then the problem of that even being after the fact, after the paper was published and I received a diagnosis, the problem of data sharing still persists. So it's almost as if I'm back at square, I won't say one, now I have a genetic diagnosis, but having to kind of restart a lot of the same work that has already been done, that had already been done five years ago, three to five years ago. So I see that as a big problem. I know other rare disease families also face this problem. Mm -hmm. And I think there's some absolute ways to be able to fix this and by empowering patients uh, and making sure that they have access, the access that they should have inherently uh, to their own data, even in the research setting. And we can maybe, if you want to get into exactly what distinguishes the research setting and my inability to access my genomic data to what would be maybe more clinically oriented and covered by HIPAA. Yeah, no, I would uh, much rather talk about this. This this is uh, much more interesting to me than whatever I was going to ask about. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So I, I just going back a few steps before we get into the, you know, research versus clinical setting, um, you know, it sounds like a no-brainer to me why uh, like a patient yeah, like a patient should be able to get their their data is what I'm saying is a no-brainer. That sounds like a no-brainer to me. So my my sort of interest or curiosity is, you know, what's the counter argument? Why is that a problem? Is it some is it somehow interfering with the you know quality or, or veracity of the study or something like that? Well, so sure, maybe, um, and, and that's more not a so that's one that would be one pushback, and that's absolutely uh, I think valid in the sense that. If I have information to which a physician scientist, a scientist wants to publish on, well, you, you know, you do have to be careful of the fact that a patient with data and and their ability to publish that first could could actually interfere with the ability of the scientists and the research group doing such data, and and making sure that they publish first, and that, that is a legitimate concern. But to me, I, I don't see that being such a concern that, you know, you couldn't have a patient and a patient uh, and the researchers or the center of, uh, of research sign some type of non-disclosure agreement. Mm-hmm. And, 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 you know, maybe, maybe it would have to be a little bit more in depth or complicated than that, but fine, we'll, we'll jump through the hoops. It's a solvable problem is what you mean. It's not something Absolutely. that, right. Okay. It's a solvable problem and, and it could save on literally on the order of years. And again, in my condition, because it's not progressive, you know, maybe it's okay that I waited a few years in some people's opinions. I mean, not mine, but <laughs> in the case of, of rare progressive diseases, those years matter more than anything. 
And yeah. the fact that some people might not get an answer because of this misaligned incentive in academic medicine and, and the pursuit of patients, which ultimately is a better quality of life through usually translational therapeutics, then, then that's where I see a major problem and something that we can fix and we should fix. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, this is something I, I definitely kind of want to spend more time on, uh, not on the podcast, but it, it's sort of the first time I'm hearing about this as, as being sure. a major issue. Um, and I want to find out more about it and, and maybe write about it or, or something like that. Um, but I guess, so you brought up like the, the common, uh, you know, time is important because patients um, in that time, they can seek out translational therapies. Well, that's one reason why the time is important, right? Um, sure. And that sounds to me like it goes hand in hand with this concept of what you discussed earlier, uh, the clinical versus research setting. Um, so could you sort of uh, expand further on what you, you meant by that? Yeah, sure. And I'm by no means an expert. I guess I'm, I'm more coming from my own perspective and, and, and experience. But I'll say this. It, I mean, well, this is exactly what happened. When I went to the center or the research group that was working on my condition, I, I requested a few things, which they, I mean, ultimately a, gene, a gene, right? I wanted the, the three to six letter code of a gene so that I could start looking into exactly the the ways by which I think that we could solve this problem. Mm -hmm. But even more than that, I said, you know, I want my sequence data back. And at the end of the day, I guess simply the answer from this group was no. Um, and, and, and I don't think that should, you know, I, I, I didn't like that answer. I'll say that. Now, how so is this like your, um, your, this, you couldn't get the sequence. So I like, it's not like 23 and me where they just tell you what your, your genes are. It's, they it, said yeah, you can't I mean, look at I, it. That's true. If you wanted raw data from 23 and me, you could get it right. Mm -hmm. In this case, I cannot get it. Okay. Why? Cause I was told no. Now in the, in the context of more of, of a clinical setting, you know, if you were to send out a, any type of genome sequencing out to a private company like Invite or GeneDX, um, somebody that does provide clinical genomes then a patient and a parent would, regardless of how this research is being, how this data, this genomic data is being used to identify new cases uh, of whatever disease you might be interested in, that parent, that patient would be able to go to those companies and say, hey, I want the raw data. And they would give it to them. So there's, there's that stark difference of the research setting versus the clinical setting. And I, I, I and of course, I'm but the furthest thing from an expert on, on HIPAA and HIPAA laws, but by HIPAA, you'd be able to request that data, um, yeah. which of course, in my setting, in my case, I was very clearly uh, not able to. Yeah, I, I'm not an expert on HIPAA either, but I, even, you know, I know that patients are, uh, they do have the right to request data from even hospitals, you know, like what was the exam results, you know, what are sure. the imaging results, Um you know, what, 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 exactly what drugs did you give me? What, um, right. And th they are uh, required to, to give that information, but I have heard stories of them making it very, very difficult to do so. Um, you know, making you like have weird printer requirements or like having to even pay a fee I've, I've heard. Um, sure. So just sounds like this, this whole issue of data gets very hairy and very sticky. Uh, I've always heard of it in the context of, um, you know, hospital records, but it sounds like now, you know, your own genes are, are, uh, are also, you know, not wanting to be shared with the individual. That does seem weird to me. I mean, it's literally your genes. It's, it's could, you could, you could say it's like the software or the programming for who you are in, in many ways. So it seems weird not to be able to, um, to get it under any circumstances, uh, 23 and me or through the study or, or elsewise or otherwise. Um, yeah, so that, that's, um, I'm, I love that you brought that up. That's like completely new territory for me and I'll have to look sure. more into it. And I'm sure anyone listening, probably unless they um, are in this space, they might not know about that. So I'm glad you are, are helping to make people aware. Sure. Um, so could you, I wanted to sort of transition over into, we touched on gene therapy a little bit. Um, you know, it's weird because I've seen some approved gene therapies and I understand how like that specific drug works, um, you know, things like Luxturna for mm -hmm. um, 
like uh, retinitis pigmentosa, I believe it's called. Um, but, you know, it's, it's hard for me to understand what is considered a gene therapy and what is not. Um, so like, is gene therapy a catch-all for anything that sort of touches the genome? Like does an RNA therapeutic count, um, you know, RNA interference? You know, what is, is, or is gene therapy specifically referring to like one mechanism of action? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. And honestly, I don't know if there's really a consensus kind of in the field of, of gene therapy and maybe more broadly, just like genetic medicine in general. Yeah. I think, of course, like whenever I say the word gene therapy, my mind immediately goes to AAV viral vectors, right? Which is, which ultimately are one type of gene therapy. Mm -hmm. So I, I, you know, I think gene therapy more broadly does kind of encompass everything that you mentioned. Okay. And maybe can be kind of used synonymously with genetic medicine. Uh, but maybe there's kind of like a, a, an immediate reaction or thought of AAV gene therapy just because of its so far success in the clinic, um, mm -hmm. let alone maybe it's, it's I think, uh, one of the first genetic technologies, medicines to make it to the clinic for, um, for the conditions, of course, that it has. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, I don't think there's really a consensus yet. Yeah, that, maybe that's why I'm confused then. Um, yeah, because I, I think you're you're probably right. I, I think if a new technology were to emerge, it would probably get lumped into that category, or they would start, you know, coming up with more specific definitions. Um, you know, obviously thinking about things like gene editing and um, right and so on. Right. I mean, gene editing like definitely seems to to fit the the definition of gene therapy. Um, so, so let, let's talk about AAV uh, gene therapies. So could you just give like a brief overview? I think most people listening to this probably uh, know what it, what it is, but maybe an overview of, of why that's a relevant uh, vector, why AAVs are so important in, in gene therapy. Yeah, sure. So AAV, it stands for adeno-associated virus. And not to be confused, which it commonly is with adenovirus or a, uh, AD, AV. Um, I, I believe like it was found back in the 60s or like way back in the day as a contaminant of adenovirus. And so of course it gets the name adeno-associated virus, yeah. even though they're <laughs> completely different viruses with different capsids and different uh, capsid proteins, um, different genomes. Uh, but basically, you know, AAV is a small little, what's known to be non-pathogenic, non-integrating vector uh, that's able to hold genetic cargo for in fact, gene transfer. Uh, and it's been used and it's, it's become such a, I guess, such a great clinical candidate because of the fact that it's been known to be non-pathogenic and not cause disease, um, and as well as being relatively a, a great vector for transduction in specific organs and specific tissues of which the diseases you see in clinical development for are really great at being solved by AAV gene mm -hmm. therapy. Yeah, so it sounds like the, and just along with my understanding is, um, it sounds like some of the dis diseases that are being pursued with AAV gene therapy um, kind of do fall in line with um, these organs where it, it gets effectively delivered. Is, is that sort of like the limiting factor in, in that regard, where it gets delivered? Yeah, t definitely to some degree. It is interesting though, I mean, I think it's it's kind of been known now that almost 95, depending on, of course, route of administration and, and things like of that nature, let alone type of AAV, of which there are different types, most of it's going to get to the liver. Mm -hmm. And that's why you've seen such great clinical development for, for many liver diseases, many organic acidemias, lysosomal storage disorders. Um, but, but nonetheless, I mean, we've actually seen the first two AAVs approved by the FDA treat a, an eye disease and be uh, administered into the eye directly, as well as uh, a muscular disease, mm -hmm. or I'm sorry, a CNS condition. So right. it, it can, in fact, uh, it, it's not necessarily only for the liver, where it probably will mostly go. And in, in those two cases, those are, I, I think you might've mentioned, but um, they're direct injections sort of in the, the site um, where you want it to act. So I think um, with, with Lux Turna, it's in the eye and in the retina. Mm -hmm. And um, is it, is it uh, Spinraza or the other one? I always uh, mix them up. Well, Zolgensma, but you're right. Zol Spinraza Zolgensma. is another. Right, right. And that's, is that administered like directly into the uh, spinal fluid? It's, it's systemic, it's IV. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. 
Huh. But but I, when I say that, I I'm trying to remember, and I'm sure somebody will will know this. They might have been testing different routes of administration, but I know the approved uh, the the label is for IV administration as it sits. For children that's, who are under. Yeah, that's that's really interesting to me because um, I I was always just under the um, impression that I had trouble kind of getting into that space, um, but but uh, maybe I need to look into it more. <laughs> been working, you know, quite beautifully. There was a, well, this is, this was uh, the other drug that you mentioned, Spinraza, which is an ASO, but hey, another genetic therapy really at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And there was a really great uh, documentary called The Gene on PBS. I don't know if you uh, saw that, um, which was, I believe, based on uh, Sid McCurgy's book, also by the same title, The Gene. And it did feature a family that had a child, a kid with SMA, and him having received uh, spin raza, not zolgesma. And really, I mean, the outcomes are unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Are these outcomes um, in, in this case, um, are they life prolonging? Are they quality of life improvement? Are they all of the above? Um, I, my understanding is that they help with movement quite a bit. Sure. Yeah. I, I'll leave it at, I know they are absolutely quality of life improving, but maybe, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if we know everything about them. I, I certainly don't, but yeah. nonetheless, like some of the featured stories that I've personally read show that, yes, like these drugs are transformative relative to how this disease will manifest without any treatment or with the current previous, I should say, standard of care. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I can't believe I forgot all of this. Uh, when, when these drugs first got approved, I remember everyone was all over them. And, and uh, I remember knowing a lot more at the time. Um, so I'll have to look into that as, as well. Um, really uh, exciting times, though. I mean, this is all within the last like three or four years, maybe five years, right? When these drugs were approved. Yeah, right. Luxterna was 2016 or 17. Mm -hmm. And we're really at an inflection, I believe, with, with genetic medicine, gene therapy, especially AAV specifically. But mm -hmm. we have to remember, like, this is, this is the time we are at today is really on the shoulders of literally the last five decades, probably, of research in, in the field. Yeah. Well, that's course, why I, I think it's so around. cool that you go ahead. I was sorry. I was going to say lo much longer than I've been around, and, and of course, <laughs> we're using this the the learnings of of many of previous generations. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's it's just uh, exemplified by I mean the fact that I mean you're at the Human Genome Research Institute. I, I I'm actually not sure of this, but I assume they're the the people in charge of running the Human Genome Project. Um, they were back know. in the day, right? They were, I yeah. think they were doing something else back then, but then you're right. Uh, okay, so maybe they had a different name, but um, but yeah, I mean, is any of this possible with, without that giant study? Uh, probably, you know, I would say no. I mean, I would say like in the context of my own condition, definitely not. Mm -hmm. um, the human genome really just unleashed a wave of, of really like a new era of medicine, I should say, not a wave, but a new era of medicine where all these conditions actually can be diagnosed because now we have at least some reference and an ability to know what should be there and, and see where things can go wrong. And if when they do design against it so that we can, we can treat it effectively. Mm -hmm. it, it really is like, it is the blueprint of life. And, and, and probably one of the, I think one of the greatest, maybe discoveries, if you want to frame it in that sense, but one of the greatest efforts of, of yeah. humans in the biomedical world, uh, at least toward understanding exactly what makes us us. Yeah, I think these like, uh, you know, nationwide massive efforts, uh, things like sending rocket ships to the moon and, and doing the human genome project. And, you know, now with the coronavirus, everyone, you know, how quickly we came up with these vaccines. I think right. all of these um, just like massive efforts seem to always, um, uh, no matter how much they take to put in and how much criticism, criticism they get for the, the cost and the other inputs, they always seem to have benefits that far, just, just so much further outweigh um, those costs. Um, and I, I think you're right. I think we're just at the beginning of, a, you said, inflection point. Um, and, and I guess that brings me to my question, which is, 
you know, is there, is there something that you're most excited for about, you know, what you're about to enter into sort of you're at the beginning of your career, just in the next couple of decades of genetic medicine is, is there something in particular you're excited about or, or just the momentum that uh, you're sort of riding into? Yeah, sure. The momentum is really exciting to see that we can treat so many rare conditions, including my own. That makes me super excited. Mm -hmm. Not only my own, but other rare inherited skin conditions. We're there. I think we need to find we need to find the right people, the most motivated people to lead those those efforts forward. Right now, I think we're actually at a at a time where even a 13 patient population indication, such as my own can actually be, can attract some level of investment. Maybe not a lot, but an, enough to where we could see meaningful change and meaningful uh, progress toward a new treatment paradigm, whatever that looks like. Of course, mm -hmm. for me, I can imagine uh, genetic technology uh, for other indications and conditions it might mean something else. That's what excites me to see, because at the current rate, we do have to, we have to remember that there are many thousands of rare diseases in fact, probably more than 7,000. Maybe I, I remember hearing a reference just recently saying that there were that there are 9,000 rare diseases now, many of which are being diagnosed every year, including mine last year. And in order to have meaningful changes in quality of life, the ones that we, patients want to see, we really need to speed up discovery and the development, research and development of, of these new technologies that really can improve quality of life. And so... Ultimately, what that's going to require, I think, is some of the things that we've already discussed, such as making sure that the patient is the center of all of this, and that when the patient thinks that they can and, and want to bring forward research in their own way by, for example, requesting data that one person has that they think could help uh, lead, that they could, that they think somebody else could help lead uh, toward an end goal, such as a new therapeutic, there shouldn't be any barriers to that. So we, there are a lot of problems we still have to fix in, in the mm -hmm. current infrastructure of, of rare disease preclinical development and maybe even clinical development, even though it seems like uh, the clinical development of rare diseases is probably at its, uh, I don't think it's ever been better. Um, but nonetheless, like to your, to your point, what excites me is the fact that now we know we can treat these conditions and, and create better standards of care. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what I hope to continue to work on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, man. And I, I definitely uh, wish you the best of, of luck in those pursuits. I think you'll be uh, very successful. Um, and, you know, there'll probably be some barriers, like you, you mentioned, along the way. Um, I'm, I'm sure those won't be the first you see. Um, but, um, you know, please let me know if there's anything I can do to help spread the word about some of those barriers and, and maybe... Sure. Uh, lobby against them or whatever it takes to kind of get, you know, the message out. Cause I think a huge part of it is, you know, so much of it is misunderstood. Even, you know, I'm about to enter a medical field and I, these nuances really just aren't taught unless you hear from someone who knows about it. Um, so, um, you know, please continue spreading the word. I wanted to just circle back. You, you mentioned an investment um, and you know, this is sort of what I meant earlier, where I mentioned not having fully appreciated the um, importance of patient advocacy groups. And I think I, I actually learned about this on a clubhouse call, but it, my understanding is, please correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the major roles of patient advocacy groups is actually not just getting the word out and raising awareness, as you might see when you see a Facebook ad or, or something like that. Um, but it's actually to raise money to do that research, to invest in those therapeutics. Is, is that kind of how it works? Are oh, they major absolutely. funders? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're right on that for sure. In fact, I'll say first, um, does provide money to, the, to some of the groups that work towards finding even the diagnoses. Um, but you're absolutely right. There are countless examples of patient advocacy groups leading forward research, funding research. Uh, they're a, a, no doubt a critical part. Um, and I think they actually have room to become even uh, a larger kind of player in, in this game um, in, in regard to if you think of, of the one place or maybe umbrella or entity that has the most, the closest access to patients and mm -hmm. that probably knows the patient's desires and, and wants best, it's probably the patient advocacy organization. Usually they are the patients themselves. So 
I absolutely see that being kind of like the way forward in, in regard to therapeutic development, especially for uh, these ultra rare conditions, one such as my own. Mm -hmm. And um, and in the examples that we've seen with like Cure SMA and their efforts in in finding treatments for SMA have been undoubtedly successful because now SMA has is an indication with three approved therapeutics, which is which is honestly amazing. And you see this. Uh, there are so many other you know examples of where this this patient advocacy led research and their efforts in research have worked and led to better quality of life because of the fact that they've led to approved treatments. Yeah, yeah, I, I think you're, you're hitting the nail right on the head. Um, that, I think there's probably no better example, right, than the one you just mentioned. Um, so, 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 yeah, I mean, uh, I won't take any more of your time. So, you know, thanks so much for coming on and, and sharing your, your knowledge of this area with us and especially sharing your story. Um, sure. Um, so, so yeah, I'll, uh, I'll wrap this up here and I'll turn off this recording and we can kind of, uh, Hey everyone. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Please check out the show notes to find out more about Stefanos, follow him online and read about his diagnostic odyssey on medium. Thanks so much. Take care.